Good afternoon and welcome to Hand Wavy Chemistry. When people first start chemistry, they have a tendency to try and just memorize everything. For most people, they realize that this is a fool's errand when they are confronted with the periodic table. It has 118 elements, each with their own atomic mass, radius, ionization energy, electronegativity, and then there's all the different isotopes as well. But for some of them, they persevere and continue with this mindset of, I can remember it all. That is, until they reach organic chemistry. Now confronted with an unlimited number of reagents and reaction conditions, there is no way to simply remember it all. And so what do organic chemists do? They practice drawing mechanism after mechanism after mechanism. Reaction mechanisms are detailed step-by-step -step diagrams thinking about how it is that the two molecules come together and react. By doing this, they start to cultivate a mindset that enables them to rationalize and predict the products from a specific reaction. Today, I would like to illustrote this change in mindset from rote memorization to rationalization using a relatively simple example. The reaction of hydrogen bromide with an alkene. Now, I chose this reaction because it is often introduced at the high school level where there are no mechanisms and students are simply required to memorize what happens. And when taught at this level, a simple symmetrical alkene is used, such as cyclohexene, and the students are told that hydrogen bromide adds across the double bond, giving bromocyclohexane as the product. But this tells us nothing about how the reaction occurs. It simply looks like we have broken a carbon-carbon double bond and formed a carbon-hydrogen and a carbon-bromine single bond. When we next encounter this reaction, it is slightly more complicated. Our alkene is no longer symmetrical. For example, we could have one methyl cyclohexanoene as our reactant. And now, when the reaction occurs, we see only one product. We see the formation of one bromo, one methyl cyclohexane, and that's it. And often, if you're still in the memorize everything mindset, you learn this as Markovnikov's rule, that the proton goes to the carbon that had more hydrogens on it at the start. But there is an actual mechanistic reason why we only see this one major product. And that comes down to the stability of the intermediates. The first step of this type of reaction is the double bond breaking and grabbing a proton. When it does so, it generates a carbocation. And this carbocation can either be on the carbon with the methyl group attached to it or adjacent to it. The adjacent position is what's known as a secondary carbocation. Meanwhile, the position with the methyl group attached is a tertiary carbocation. Tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary. And we can understand how the stability results in one major product forming when we look at the reaction coordinate diagram. The energy required to overcome the activation barrier and form the tertiary carbocation is much lower than the energy required to form the secondary. And so the reaction primarily proceeds via this pathway. Think of it this way. If I asked you to run to the top of the hill, or to run to the top of a mountain, you're going to get to the top of the hill faster. And so that reaction path is faster, and we get a lot more of that product. Now, with this idea in mind, we're going to move on to the next level of this question, which is actually the question that inspired this video. The reaction of hydrogen bromide with 3-methyl cyclohexanoene yields a mixture of four products, cis and trans 1-bromo-3-methyl cyclohexane and cis and trans 1-bromo-2-methyl cyclohexane. The analogous reaction 
of hydrogen bromide with three bromocyclohexanoene yields trans 1,2-dibromocyclohexane as the sole product. Draw structures of the possible intermediates and explain why only a single product is formed from the reaction of hydrogen bromide and 3-bromocyclohexane. Now we can draw out chemical structures to represent this. Maybe that will make it clearer. For you see, when we have the 3-methylcyclohexane, we get these four products. The two isomers of 1-bromo-3-methylcyclohexane and the two isomers of 1-bromo-2-methylcyclohexane. And when the reaction involves 3-bromocyclohexane, we only get a single product, the trans 1,2-dibromocyclohexane. Let's start with 3-methylcyclohexane and try and figure out why we get four products. The first step of our reaction is the same as we saw before. That double bond is going to grab a proton and it could go into one of two positions, generating a carbocation. In this case, both of those positions are secondary carbocations, so we don't really expect there to be much difference in the energy required to form them. So once those carbocations are formed, the negatively charged bromide can come in and complete the reaction. Now carbocations are flat. They have a trigonal planar geometry, so it is equally likely that our bromine will come in from the underside or the top side of the ring which is why we see both cis and trans isomers for our products. Now, before I explain the second half of this question, I first want to talk about a different reaction, the reaction of bromine with an alkene. When bromine reacts with cyclohexene, the first step does not generate a carbocation. Instead, a charged cyclic species known as the bromonium ion is formed. This bromonium ion occupies one side of the ring, so when our bromide comes in to attack, it has to do so from the other side, as it is sterically blocked from the bromonium side. And this is why, when we react an alkene with bromine, we only get anti-addition, that is, the bromines coming in on opposite sides, forming the trans isomer. So now let's think about our bromocyclohexene question. We know that the only observed product is trans 1,2-dibromocyclohexane. So it would make sense to think about using a bromonium intermediate. So rather than having that proton attach and forming a carbocation, we could have it attach and form a bromonium ion. Once that's formed, we could have attack by the bromide to the opposite side giving the trans product. So let's rationalize this further by looking at some reaction coordinate diagrams. In the case of the 3 methylcyclohexene, we said there was no real difference in the energy of either of those carbocations. As such, we would expect both reaction pathways to be followed in approximately equal amounts. But once we switch to having bromine attached to the ring, now there is a difference and the bromonium ion pathway is lower in energy than the carbocation pathway. And, once again, because it's quicker to run to the top of a hill than it is to get to the top of the mountain, this is the pathway that is primarily followed, and we only observe the one major product of trans 1,2-dibromocyclohexane. Now, I mentioned way back at the start of the video that the reaction conditions can also have an effect on the products formed. And this is highlighted by a very similar question that also pops up in undergraduate organic chemistry. Treatment of 3-methylcyclohexanoene with hydrogen chloride yields three products, cis and trans 1-chloro-3-methylcyclohexane and 1-chloro-1-methylcyclohexane. Draw a mechanism to explain this result. In our previous examples, as soon as we formed our positively charged intermediate, we brought in the negatively charged bromide and reacted it to form the final product. However, if we were to choose a solvent that were able to stabilize these ionic intermediates, or potentially 
adjust the concentration so that it takes a while for the bromide to find our carbocation, then we now have time for other reaction pathways to pop up. For example, the hydride shift. If we have a secondary carbocation next to a tertiary carbon atom, it is possible for the hydrogen on the tertiary carbon to move over to the secondary, which generates a tertiary carbocation, which, as we said earlier, is lower in energy than a secondary one. So we can rationalize what's happening in our hydrogen chloride reaction by thinking about this rearrangement. The very first step is the same as what we had when hydrogen bromide reacted with 3-methylcyclohexene. We generate two secondary carbocations, one of which is stuck, and that's what's going to give us our cis and trans 1-chloro-3-methylcyclohexane, and the other one, which is adjacent to a tertiary carbon. So here, we can have a hydride shift occur, and once that happens, now, our tertiary carbocation can react with the chloride, giving 1-chloro-1-methyl-cyclohexane as the product. All of these reaction pathways help to explain why it is that very few reactions have a 100% yield, rather producing a mixture of products that have to be cleaned up and isolated through techniques such as column chromatography. But that is a story for another day. I hope you have enjoyed this video, and if you have, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And if there is a topic you'd like to see covered in a future video, please put it down in the comment section below. Thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.